on to the presentation. So just wanted to read the bios of our uh, two presenters. First and foremost, in the background, answering questions, we have Susie Richmond, who is the Executive Director of Neighborhood Cats. She joined the organization after over 20 years running a major New York City shelter and nonprofit veterinary clinic. At Neighborhood Cats, she has led multiple large targeted TNR projects in New York City and Northern New Jersey, managed a program for providing scholarships to veterinarians for training in high volume spay neuter community cats and co-authored the Humane Society of the United States online course on TNR. In her spare time, she can often be found trapping feral cats on Maui. And then we have Brian Cordes, who is the co-founder and national programs director for Neighborhood Cats a leading community cat advocacy group with hands-on programs in New York City, New Jersey, and Maui. Currently, he and his wife, Susie, live in Hawaii and can usually be found trapping cats or releasing them after they've been neutered. In between stints with neighborhood cats, he served as a grants manager for PetSmart Charities, overseeing over $21 million, that's $21 million in TNR and spay-neuter projects. He has produced many of the leading educational materials on trap neuter return, including award-winning books and videos has assisted numerous communities on setting up large scale TNR programs and is a frequent presenter on community cat issues. Brian has a Bachelor of Arts degree from Cornell University and a JD from the University of California, Berkeley. All right, I'm gonna hand it over to Brian. Okay, thank you so much, Stacey. And thanks everybody for taking time out today to learn more about how to help um, these cats. So let's uh, jump right into it. And the first thing I think I wanna you know, and focus on is what forms the the bond between um, colony caretakers and their and their cats, and that's food. And it's um, you know that that is really the basis of the relationship. And and you guys who are out there now um, taking care of community cats uh, know how uh, much they depend on you and how they kind of build their day around your. Uh, arrival time and that um, they will bond with you. Uh, be, you know, it starts off as you're their feeder and then um, they'll develop a special relationship with you that they won't have with anyone else. And they, you know, a lot of them can become quite friendly and affectionate towards you, probably not towards uh, too many other people. So that's where I want to start today is um, talking about food, talking about feeding. So those of you who took the certification workshop, that you'll, you'll have heard this before, but it, um, for those who haven't, and also it bears uh, repeating, that one of the best practices to get into as a caretaker is to develop a feeding pattern. And that's um, taking advantage of the fact that cats are extremely habitual creatures. So those of you who have pet cats, which I'm gonna bet is uh, the majority, uh, you know that uh, breakfast is going to be served uh, at the same time every day, whether you want to or not. Um, and they will go to any length to get you up and uh, get the can open. And that's because they're just hardwired to to get fed at that time. So outdoor cats are no different. And if you feed them um, at the same time, uh, same place on a daily basis, they'll start to show up before you do and they'll be there every day at that time. Now, um, if you can't do it exactly at the same time every day, then just do it as close as you can. So always feed in the morning or always feed in um, after dusk or whatever it might be. Try to narrow that window as much as you can. Uh, try to develop a sound uh, that they associate with feeding. Uh, sometimes they figure that out themselves. Like a lot of people will, uh, have probably observed that the cats know the sound of your car's engine so that as soon as you pull up they're they're starting to come out but you can also shake your keys or use a clicker or whistle or whatever it might be what you want to avoid is leaving food out all the time uh, that uh, the feeding pattern is going to help you with monitoring the colony so every time you go to feed you're going to have a snapshot of what's going on. Are there any newcomers? Is, 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 did anybody get hurt? Is, um, is there some type of intervention that's needed? You'll be able to tell really easily because you're going to be seeing all the cats every day. If you're trapping, it's essential. 
and this is what we went over in the certification workshop that knowing where the cats are going to be and when they're going to be there makes it possible to to trap them otherwise you're you're guessing and it's hit or miss so don't leave food out 24 7. it will uh, make it impossible to monitor them and, and very difficult to trap if you need to and then there are other reasons that have to do with uh, wildlife so you want to you want to avoid if you're in an area where there is wildlife and there's um, that could be the middle of Manhattan these days. Um, there's pretty much wildlife everywhere. So if you don't want to attract them, and, and, and you should try to avoid that for a number of reasons for the safety, number one, for the safety of the wildlife, um, especially raccoons. Uh, you know, health officials get very skittish when raccoons get too close to people, and it's not good. You know, you don't want them competing with the cats. So how you avoid them has a lot to do with what kind of wildlife we're talking about. So raccoons are mostly nocturnal. And if you feed the cats in the daylight, you'll be able to avoid um, attracting them. So we don't want raccoons around the cat, uh, the cat food. So uh, with raccoons, try to feed uh, closer to daylight or, or maybe at uh, dawn or dusk, but not at a time. Um, actually, they're pretty active at dusk, so maybe dawn and during the day. Uh, now, um, if we're talking about birds, that that's different. Well, they're they're diurnal and they go to sleep at night for the most part. And again, this has to do with you can train the cats. You know, when you think about how long it takes, if if you're not um, hopefully you're not leaving dry food out all day for your pet cats. That's it's not healthy for them. Um, cats are feast and famine animals. So when they smell food, their digestive system gets started. And if they're always smelling food, their digestive system is always going. And you can end up with, you know, five-year-old cats with kidney disease. So you should just feed, uh, you know, two, three, once, whatever it is, times a day. And if you do that, you'll notice that the cats uh, pretty much eat everything within a few minutes. So you, with the outdoor cats, you really don't need a long a window of time to train them to come in. And then just don't leave any uneaten food behind and you won't be having wildlife come to that location. Now, there was a question, I know that was sent in before about somebody who's dealing with raccoons and they've tried everything, um, but you haven't tried this. This is um, a kind of feeder that, uh, let's say you have to feed at night, right? Or let's say the raccoons have figured it out and they are coming during the day. Um, you can feed on this, you can build this kind of a feeder that will prevent raccoons or any kind of animal that climbs like a, a possum or skunks, you know, the ones with the claws that can go up. And uh, if you, oh, let me say one thing about the handouts. All the slides that you're seeing are um, one of the handouts and the slides have live links. So you, you don't have to try to um, copy all this down, Just just, watch and download the handout. You can get the, the plans uh, by clicking on that link, Forgotten Felines of Foresight. But the basic idea is that raccoons can climb, but they can't jump. So if you create a platform like this, which has a long pole and then a wide platform, and you put something around the platform like metal sheeting that the raccoons can't grip onto, then they can't um, climb up to it. But if you have a little jump off station, like you see in the right on that picture, the cats can go onto the jump off station, jump up, and then eat. Uh, you know, if you have elderly cats who have difficulty jumping, then, then that's going to be an issue. And you may have to feed them uh, separately. Now, one mistake I've seen made, and it's a very funny one in videos, was somebody built one of these, and then they put the jump off station too high and the raccoons were able, they can jump uh, horizontally. <laughs> so they were jumping from the jump off station onto the platform. So make sure your jump off station is lower and that um, in order for an animal to get onto the platform, they would have to jump up. So birds are, um, like I said, they're active during the day. So if birds are the problem, like pigeons or here in Maui, we have um, uh, we have feral chickens 
and they're they're kind of all over the place and they're not the least bit afraid of the, and the cats and in fact it's just the opposite the cats run away from from the roosters and they're quite aggressive about you know eating all the cat food very quickly so what do you do there well he, you know here people will feed at night after dusk in order to avoid the chickens that's the easiest way if you have to feed during the daytime try a feeding station like you see here this in this photo this is a, a storage bin i think about a 20 18 gallon um, plastic outdoor storage bin and a door has been cut into the long side there's we'll talk about feeding stations later but you need two doors one on each end so that a cat can't go in there and keep every all the other cats out but you you use a box cutter to slice open um, a doorway and then cover the doorway with these plastic strips. Like sometimes you see those at grocery stores in the winter time. Um, so people can come in and out, but the plastic traps the heat inside the store. Well, birds are gonna be very reluctant to pass through that plastic, uh, but cats will not be. So that's one way to keep the birds away from the food. Uh, another thing is um, just feed the birds something that the cats don't like. So, uh, you know, when we, we do this when we're trapping in the daytime here and there's uh, chickens all over the place, we'll put a big pile of cracked corn on the side and they, the chickens love that. So they go eat that and they stay uh, away from the bait in the traps. Okay, so that's about when to feed. Let's talk about what to feed. And a basic, basic understanding of nutrition is important. Um, we like to say that, you know, our formula for what kind of food should you get is uh, the the highest quality that you as a caretaker can comfortably afford. And that takes two things into account. It, uh, the fact that nutrition is important. So if you, you know, the higher quality you can feed, the, the better for the cats, but your budget's very important too. So what is the best quality you can comfortably afford is going to have a lot to do with what are your means, how many cats are you feeding, uh, things like that. So, you know, if you're one of those uh, people today who's uh, the 24 percent who's feeding over 20 cats, well, your calculation about what's the most nutritious you can um, afford is going to be a lot different than somebody who's feeding, you know, three cats in their backyard. So no judgment on what foods you uh, actually land on, just try to keep in mind that within your budget, you want to get the best you can. So how do you tell what the best is? And one way to, it's not definitive, but uh, a good starting point is the ingredients label. And that's what you see circled in red in this uh, photo. And if you'll notice, uh, the, you know, it lists the ingredients, but it's not random. It's whatever ingredient has the highest volume is going to be listed first. So uh, in this particular cat food, beef is the largest ingredient, uh, most quantity, and then beef broth, and then chicken liver, and then kidney. So it's a good food. Now, um, a lower quality food is going to have like uh, corn, or um, it's going to say things like uh, byproducts, which are kind of meat related, but not that's not not the um, uh, healthiest cuts of of um, whatever the um, animal is. So um, look for a food that has whole meat, because uh, of course cats are obligate carnivores, so they have to eat meat. So the more that's in there, the better. Um, things with lots of corn and things and and byproducts and uh, meal are generally not as uh, nutritious. It is the case that the better quality foods are usually the pricier ones. There, there is that relationship. We'll talk about um, some waste uh, products that, that combine good cost and good nutrition, but especially if you're talking about canned food, that uh, the more higher quality the ingredients, the higher the price. Now, if you want to learn more about nutrition, and that's just a very basic primer, on where to get started, there's there's a lot of great resources. We highly recommend the book The Natural Cat by Anitra Frazier. She really um, she's an advocate of a raw food diet, 
and she talks about why, but she, it's just a wealth of information about nutrition and everything else, cat. Uh, and then there's a few websites you can have a look at that are also really rich in information about um, what's in cat food and how to tell the better ones from the lower quality ones. So one of the basic um, debates that you'll find out there when it comes to cat food is, you know, should you be feeding wet versus dry or really, you know, which one is more nutritious? And, and you'll get opinions all over the map, even from veterinarians. But I, I like to break it down into a very simple uh, graphic, which you see here, which is if, if you were going out for dinner and, and, and you're not vegan or vegetarian and you ordered a steak, would you rather eat the uh, wet meat on the left of your screen or the dried out, um, burnt out dry meat <laughs> that's on the right? And obviously you would prefer the wet. And the reason it's more nutritious, it, it, the reason for that is because, you know, it's not, everything's not baked to a crisp, right? It's not, um, when, when the baking process occurs with dry food, it naturally destroys a lot of the nutrients in in the meat itself. Now your um, higher quality dry foods are going to add, because they know that the baking process destroys a lot of the, the nutrition, they add vitamins and supplements and minerals after the baking process. But that's a costlier procedure. So the cheaper dry foods don't do that. They put everything in, they bake it to a crisp and they don't add anything afterwards. So in general, it's better, the more wet food that the cats can get, the, the better within an equivalent brand. Um, you can, if you can feed the wet food of, of friskies versus the dry food, you're better off with the wet food. Now, that's not to say that you're gonna just, you know, we're gonna talk about winter time and how food freezes. And like I say, you may be uh, feeding a lot of cats um, and, and just, uh, wet food all the time is just not going to be practical or affordable. So the moral of the story isn't feed them nothing but wet meat. The moral is make sure they get some, you know, and the more that you can get to them, uh, the more nutrition they'll be getting. So how about that idea of value? We talked about this formula of the best quality you can comfortably afford. So these are some of the um, better value in, in um, the research that we've done and that other um, people who are more proficient at this have done, have recommended to us. And you could, like I say, download this handout and you'll have these brands. Uh, they're pretty much all of them are available online. And uh, the Kirkland Signature is actually the Costco store brand. So good reason to get a, a Costco card. So these are, are all, you know, um, dry foods, but they, they combine, um, they're, they're relatively high nutrition. Uh, so they're, they're really good values when, when you look at them, how much they cost per pound, and you look at the ingredients in them. So if you're feeding lots of cats and you're feeding lots of dry food, you, you may be better off with one of these brands for the same price that you're paying now for like Deli Cat or something like that. Okay, so um, talked about uh, when to feed and what to feed. Let's talk a bit about uh, where to feed. And in general, with community cats, our experience at Neighborhood Cats is that um, the, the less visible the cats are, the better. Because uh, it, it just attracts less attention. It, it, it uh, makes it much less likely somebody's going to drop off a cat at your colony site if they're not seeing, um, like, hey, this is a place where cats are fed. So, uh, it, you know, again, within the realm of possibilities. So if you can feed in your backyard instead of in your front yard, that's, that's going to be better. If you can feed behind a big pile of rocks uh, instead of next to a fence by the sidewalk, that's going to be better. So um, you also want to be having minimal impact um, on your the neighbors and on uh, people who are at work. Again, the idea is, you know, we, we don't want the cats to um, be a problem for anyone. It's also, you know, you want it to be safe and quiet for the cats. Think about 
your ability to, to access the spot. So um, are you going to be able to get there in the wintertime if it snows? Um, do you need a key and somebody would always let you in? So think about when you're choosing where to feed them um, yourself and your ability to, to get there. If you're in an area where there's uh, any type of threatened wildlife, uh, you know, with endangered species of some sort, or just uh, it's called rare, threatened, or endangered. And in some uh, states, they have a category called uh, wildlife of special concern. Try to feed the cats as far away from where the wildlife hangs out as possible. So if you're feeding in a park, and the park has rare ground nesting birds, feed the cats at the other end of the park. Keep, keep them as far away as possible. And that will definitely help um, with any type of predation issue. Okay, um, avoid putting food directly on the ground or curb like you see here, uh, kind of for obvious reasons, which is you, you really, as we said before, you don't wanna be leaving food behind. And uh, th that, you know, can cause all sorts of problems with attracting wildlife and neighbor complaints. You want to use something you can pick up when the cats are done eating. So it could be um, plastic plates that you can wash and reuse, or even cardboard, plastic containers, anything that allows you to um, clean up afterwards. So why, why do I keep focusing on cleaning up? Because it's the number one complaint that people who are not taking care of community cats have against cat feeders is that they are leaving a mess behind. And um, you know, uh, for those of you who are very, um, you know, have been very diligent about keeping the site clean, you know, you're, you're definitely bearing the brunt of unfair accusations, but you do sometimes see situations like you see in this slide where people just leave the dishes behind and it's just a complete uh, mess. And, um, you know, if you were living n next to that, you probably wouldn't be too happy about it either. So um, if you can, you know, uh, if it's at all breezy where you are and things like that, then, you know, avoid using really lightweight paper plates that can just, that will just easily blow away before you can pick them up. Pick up all the trash in your colony area, in your feeding area. Don't just say, I didn't leave that, you know, um, takeout dish here, so I'm not gonna pick it up. That that doesn't really help the cats. Um, the cleaner, the better, and you, you know, you'll be known as a good neighbor. Also, don't leave bags of trash on site that have any food, uh, any scent of food inside. So don't pick up all the paper plates, shove them in a trash bag, and then leave the trash bag on the side because you'll get it later. Because you know, other wildlife will come along and rip it open. And it can be, you know, ripped plastic bags can be a threat to to the wildlife. So we mentioned, I think I mentioned feeding stations, but if not. They're a great idea if, if you can put them on your site. And here's, here's an example of one you see that's made out of uh, plywood. And the reason they're great is because, again, they help with that idea of um, keeping the feeding less visible, uh, with keeping everything neat, gives you a place to, to potentially you know, keep your dishes and other supplies instead of having to lug them around like you know, gallons of water, things like that. It allows the cats to eat during the, um, you know, if, if it is bad weather, they, they have a sheltered area where they can go. And as I mentioned before, don't make a feeding station with just like one little door because, you know, the big dominant tomcat is going to go in there and he's going to not let anybody else in. So you need a nice big wide opening like you see here, or you need um, like two smaller doors. Um, on either end. Here are some ideas for feeding stations. If, if you know, the last one was a plywood one that requires, um, you know, a minimal amount of, uh, but some construction knowledge and tools. But you can make them out of uh, what you see here. So there's a, you can take a 30 gallon trash can and just put it on its side and maybe put a cinder block on 
either uh, side of the trash can to keep it in place it makes for a great feeding station. You get a very large storage bin, again, get a box cutter. Um, if you use a box cutter on this kind of hard plastic, what you're doing is you're you're tracing lines over and over. Don't try to take the box cutter and push it all the way through. Just um, trace the door and just keep going over it and over and over it and eventually the, you'll slice your way through. Um, you can get larger storage bins, smaller ones. If you are inclined to, I'd rather pay somebody else to build this for me, there's a great uh, company called Feral Via. And you can see they have a large version of a feeding station and a smaller one. And just go to their website, click on these links, and uh, just go ahead and order one. And I think you just need a screwdriver to put them together. Now, here's, you know, for, for those of you who are, um, are looking to be really creative, you can create a feeding station out of fake rocks. So there, there are these th things out there. For, they're, they're made for, like, covering, uh, you know, irrigation things or pipes or whatever it might be that's on the landscape that are not particularly attractive so they get covered with these with these faux rocks um, you can buy them they're, they're a little pricey if you buy them online and you can cut you know an opening for the cats to go in in this case you might have to keep the opening small since you're trying to be really discreet but you can use a jigsaw uh, to cut these without cracking the whole thing. But if you're um, inclined not to spend 150 bucks on a large face fake rock, go on to YouTube, do a search for how to make a, you know, a hollow faux rock cover and uh, just do it yourself. You know, you can kind of make it out of, um, I think, paper mache and then paint it in a way where it's waterproof. So a lot, a lot of great stuff out there about how to make this, um, these, these covers. Uh, gravity feeders and auto feeders can, um, you know, in, in general, as I said, ideally you want to go with not leaving food out 24-7. But of course, that's not always possible, right? Like maybe you're, you know, don't have somebody to back you up and you're going away for the weekend. Um, or maybe you can only get access to feed, put food out. Uh, every few days, you can't get there on a daily basis. So you may be in a situation where you have to leave food out. And if that's the case, then these auto uh, feeders and, and waterers are, can be great things because you, you know, you fill them up and they, they just uh, kind of, you know, spill out as, as the product in the bowl gets eaten or, or drank. If you're using the waterers, the auto waterers, don't uh, get like the, just get the one gallon. Don't get the giant ones because it's gonna be very hard for you to carry enough water to fill them up. And also you wanna be changing the water as regularly as possible. And a gallon of water should be plenty. Um, otherwise, you know, the bowl starts to get uh, algae growing in it and kind of, you know, grotty and, you know, you don't want that. So just stick with, one gallon or smaller for the water and with the dry food you know again just only get as large as you need because uh again it's it's you know you, the food is out in the elements and you, you know there's no point in filling a 20 pound auto feeder and then having half of it go bad so you know if you only need a, a couple of pounds or a five pound then then go ahead and do that um do be aware that you know, you could potentially be attracting wildlife rodents or, or other cats. So um, it's not recommended unless you really need to do it. And there are definitely times you need to do it. So, okay, just a few kind of feeding tips um, that we picked up along the way that might be helpful for you. So what if you don't have a feeding station and it's raining? You can do the trick you see on the left there, which is that's a, you know a typical um, restaurant takeout dish. If you fill it with uh, a dry food or whatever kind of food, uh, usually dry food because you're going to need it to to be around for a little bit, uh, and then turn take the top of the takeout container, turn it upside down, and put it on top of the takeout bowl. That will keep the rain out, 
And then when it, the rain is done and the cats show up, they can quite easily, they'll smell the food and they'll just push the cover off and have themselves a meal. The Vittle Vaults are great things if you um, do want to store food on site. This will keep out any animals or wildlife. It'll probably stop them from even smelling it. These things are so well made, so they're real good. If you're feeding through a fence or other hard to get to spots, uh, think about getting an arm extender. Those are the things you see in stores where people are, you know, who work there are reaching up to the top shelves to, to get items. You know, they, don't, they cost me, I don't know, maybe 15 bucks at the most. Um, and you, I, I had to feed through a fence for a while and I would use one of these to just push the bowls as far away from the fence as I could so they were out of arm's reach of anybody walking by. Feeding in the winter time, is um, an important, it's important to take into account that the cats actually need more calories during the uh, winter, not less. They, they are actually more active because they, they need to move around to keep warm. So they need a bit more food. So up, up the, the research shows they need about 15% more. So feed them a bit more during the cold season. And, um, do do avoid using metal bowls uh, when you're in sub freezing temperatures because it it's actually uh, unless these bowls are heated but even then I'd probably go with a plastic one because the cat's um, tongue if it's cold enough and the cat's tongue touches something metal it can get stuck if that ever happens to you the way you unstick the cat is you pour warm water over their tongue and it defrosts but the best thing is just to avoid that happening by not using metal bowls in very cold temperatures. Oh, sorry. Um, let me, let me, oh, one other point on the feeding in the winter. So obviously you may need to use a lot more dry food, right? Because if it's really cold and, and you, you know, you put the wet food down and five minutes later it's frozen, that's, you know, and they haven't eaten it, that's not going to do a lot of good. The way to get them wet food in the winter time is if you've got that feeding pattern and they're all there eagerly waiting, you put down wet food, it'll probably be gone by the time it could freeze. But you may have to rely uh, more on dry food. So that gets us into providing water in the winter time to these guys. And healthy cats, don't, they don't need a lot of water, but they definitely need some. And uh, so it's it's really important to keep it available as much as you can. And if you're relying primarily on dry food, it's even more important that the cats have access uh, to water. But um, so let's let's go over some of the um, tricks that are out there for uh, keeping keeping water available. So there there are some products you can buy that are a big help with this. One of them is you see on the left there, it's called a solar sipper and you can get it at that link you see there. It will um, use the sun to keep the water heated until you get to about 20 degrees. Once you get to 20 degrees or lower, it's not gonna work, it's gonna, it's gonna freeze. But if you're you know, in a climate where it's often you know, hovering around freezing, this bowl should work to, you know, if it's out in getting some sunlight um, to keep the water from uh, freezing. Another item that people have used is um, something called Snuggle Safe that you can buy online. And it's meant to be um, to warm up like a blanket for an indoor kitty and give them something warm to, to lie on. But you can, you can put it in your microwave, you know, heat it up and then put it under the water bowl and it will provide a heat source for at least a few hours and, and keep that uh, water from freezing. If you have, um, if you're feeding, this is only for people obviously who can plug a electric device in, but you know, maybe if you're feeding on your back porch or something like that, you could use an electric heated bowl, which is, does just what it, what it says. And this is, this is one, um, the, one of the better ones, I highly rated ones, the farmer, farm innovators. Now, 
one of the tricks with uh, you have to watch out for with heated water bowls is that uh, the water will evaporate, right? Because uh, you know you got warm water in a cold environment, and the colder it is, and the warmer the water is, the faster it will evaporate. So you need a big bowl. You don't want one of these like two quart bowls because uh, the water will evaporate too quickly. So we recommend something like this product, which has one and a half gallons. So the water will be around for quite a while uh, before it uh, kind of burns off. Now for do-it-yourself stuff, again, a lot of this is not about pre completely preventing the water from freezing. It's about slowing it down. It's about making sure water's available um, for at least a few hours around the time that the cats are eating so they get a shot at, at getting what they need. So just the type of bowl that you choose is going to have a big effect. Um, the deeper the bowl, the wider it is, and the thicker its, its sides, uh, the slower the freezing process is gonna be. Don't make the mistake of getting um, something that's kind of long and narrow that, that seems very deep, but it has a small surface area because it's the surface area that's um, the primary factor in how quickly water will freeze. If there's only a little bit of surface area that no matter how deep the water goes, the surface will freeze faster. So you want it to be wide and deep. And again, thick plastic is probably your best bet. You can also, this is one of the things I used to do, when, when I fed community cats in the Northeast was I would buy a styrofoam cooler and you can, it's hard to get them in the winter time because they're really a summer product for you know people to take their beer and soda to the beach. So you might wanna stock up on a couple of them in the summer. And then you just cut uh, an opening on one of those short sides, you know, a little doorway, and then put your water bowl inside of this. So you get both the the um, good bowl and you get the styrofoam that's um, keeping the heat in when, you know, keeping the water warm. Again, not forever, but it will slow down the feeding, the freezing process. Another really creative idea I've seen is, are these small styrofoam boxes. Um, they're often used to ship vaccines or other small products like that, or you can even just buy the box online and you put a plastic bag, you line the, um, like you're putting a plastic bag in a waste, waste basket or something like that, just stick a plastic bag inside, put the top of the box back on, you fill the bag um, and the interior of the box with water and cut a little, you know, maybe two or, maybe two, three inch at the most, a circular hole in the top of this box. And then, um, the styrofoam will keep the water insulated and the cats can drink through that uh, circular opening in the top. Um, keep in mind, you know, if, again, if for wintertime feeding, the cats need to get to the food. So uh, you may, after snowing, you know, you may need to clear a path for them. And um, you want to avoid uh, things, commercial products like rock salt and chemical de-icers, because they, they can be really uh, toxic and, and irritating for the cats. So um, this is a solution that will melt the snow and the ice, and it's perfectly safe for them. You know, uh, you, you can see it here. It involves uh, Dawn dish detergent, some rubbing alcohol, and a half a gallon of warm water. So it's a pretty easy mixture to make, and then just pour that on the ice to to melt it away. So what about ants? You know, you're getting lots of ants in your food bowl. Um, well, the, the trick here is that ants can't swim. So if you put the food bowl inside of um, a moat, uh, if it's sitting in a thing of water, the ants will not be able to reach it. And this is an example of a kind of do-it-yourself one where we have the food bowl sitting on a cookie tray with like a quarter inch of water. So the cats can easily reach it and the insects can't. You can, um, if you wanna buy, uh, there's lots of, you know, it's just one of these products that a lot of people have made versions of. And if you go to 
Amazon and you search for ant proof food bowls, you'll, you'll get, you know, a few dozen uh, choices if you just want to buy one, or you can build your own similar to what you see here. So what about flies? That's another common complaint. Um, flies are really difficult to completely uh, eliminate, but you can kind of reduce their presence. And the thing to understand is that they're most attracted to wet food on a hot day, right? So maybe avoid putting out canned food if you're having a problem with flies, you know, at, at noon. You know, try to feed the cats at uh, when it's a bit cooler out. Also, like the birds, the flies generally sleep at night. So if you can train the cats to eat at uh, sundown, at least during the summer, you'll be able to avoid the, um, the flies. And then they're less attracted to dry food than they are to wet food. Now, um, for the colony caretaker who has everything, uh, this, is, this is another way you can go. It's a motion activated feeding bowl. So when the cats come close, it opens up, and then when they go away, it shuts. So that's going to keep flies and um, any type of flying insect out of the food. Obviously, you know, you need a your own backyard or something like that. But if you're really struggling with it, you might think about uh, trying one of these. Okay, how about slugs? Another common complaint. Um, they're, they're pretty easy to deal with, actually. Uh, you can hear me mention this more than once. There's a product called uh, Diotomaceous Earth. And uh, I want to emphasize at the start, there's two kinds of Diotomaceous Earth on the market. One's called food grade, F-O-O-D, and one's called pool, P-O-O-L grade. You only want to use food grade uh, because if the cat somehow ingests it, it will be perfectly fine. Um, in fact, farmers use this stuff sometimes to rid their cows of parasites. They put it in the food. But if you get pool grade, that's a whole different product that it can be toxic. And what it is, diatomaceous earth is actually these tiny little marine creatures called diatoms um, that have fossilized and are crushed. So it feels to the human hand like soft powder, but it's actually um, millions of tiny little sharp fragments. And uh, so to a slug, they're gonna feel the sharpness. And if you put a circle of diatomaceous earth around your food bowl, they will not cross that because it will hurt them. Um, also, you could do the same thing. You can crush eggshells or use uh, chalk powder. It's the same idea. It's soft to your touch, but but sharp to the bugs. You can use a sheet of sandpaper. Same idea. Put the food bowl on a sheet of sandpaper. Now, if you're using diatomaceous earth or any of these powdered products, if you you, you want to be very careful if you're using a lot of it, and make sure you wear a dust mask because it. As I say, it may feel soft, but it's actually very sharp. And if you inhale it, enough of it into your lungs, you can do a lot of damage. So be careful with the stuff. Don't just, you know, breathe in a whole cloud of it or something like that. Now, another thing you can do with slugs, being, you know, a friend to all animals, um, you can feed them too. And and I used to find that was the easiest way to keep them away was I would just put a few pieces of dry food. Uh, out out uh, a few feet away from the bowls, and the slugs, you know, would it's a lot easier to just get to the food that's on the ground than it is to kind of work your way up the food bowl. So they usually just went right to um, the food that was meant for them. There you have it. Now um, I do see one question in the in the chat that um, we can get to, which is. Um, Let's see, how do we, if, if the cats don't all show up together at feeding time, how do you ensure each cat gets an equal amount of wet food um, if you don't mix the wet and the dry together? So that, that's a great question. And um, it sounds like the, what you've come up with by mixing the wet and the dry is working for you. So that's fine. 
um, you know, you have to take these kind of general principles and adapt them to the reality of what you're having to, to deal with. So if you find that mixing wet and dry food together is getting um, enough wet food to all the cats uh, and they're eating it, it's nothing to own a waste, then, then that's great. I would just continue continue doing that. And, and actually, I think that's a, that's a good tip. You know, um, I'd be interested in if you want to, uh, you know, write to us and let us know more about your experience with that. We could maybe get us a photo of a cat eating uh, the dry food mixed with the wet, and we can pass that tip on to other people because that's a great idea. All right, so let's move on, and we'll get we'll leave time at the end for for your questions. Let's talk about winter shelter. And obviously, really important for um, caretakers in cold climates. Uh, the cats really um, need your help in in the winter time to, uh, to really to stay healthy and to to ensure that they stay stay healthy and are able to sleep in a warm, dry uh, place during the day and at night. So, any kind of winter shelter that a good winter shelter is going to have these three qualities. They're going to be uh, waterproof, right? Keep out the elements. They're going to be well insulated. And the reason you need good insulation, like a thick styrofoam or um, that type of material, is because the cat's body is acting as a radiator. So they're giving off body heat. And then the winter shelter is trapping it inside and warming up the space. So if you have something like a, you know, um, a, a very expensive uh, dog house, and it's but it's made of a thinner plastic that isn't good insulation. Their body heat is just going to pass right through, and not stay in the shelter. You also want minimal uh, empty air space for this same reason. So let's say you get a big dog house that is well insulated, but um, you know the cats are there on the ground huddled together, and above them is you know, two feet of empty space, their bodies now have to heat up that empty space and that's going to waste. So you want a shelter where the cats are pretty tightly packed in and that's going to be your, your warmest if it's well insulated. So the shelter you're seeing in this particular slide is a um, large styrofoam fish box with a door cut, as you can, you can see there with Kitty poking his head out. It's wrapped in um, thick plastic and then uh, tied together with these industrial um, kind of uh, plastic ties that, that I think melt together. If you're in the New York City or Long Island area, you can actually buy these. Uh, if you go to this website, uh, it'll tell you um, what's available and, and where you can pick them up. Uh, if you wanna go with our favorite uh, winter shelter, one of the do-it-yourselves. This is this is what it looks like mid-construction. You're basically um, taking a uh, excuse me. You're taking uh, what it's an eight foot by two foot, two inch thick hard foam insulation. Okay, I'll say that again. It's eight foot by two foot. It's two inches thick, and it's a hard styrofoam. And these um, sheets, these eight foot by two foot sheets are used in um, like insulating attics and uh, things like that. And you're basically, you need a, a table saw so you get a nice clean straight cut through the two inches. But um, you're taking that two foot by eight foot sheet and you're cutting it into pieces and you're using every square inch uh, in this design and you're gluing them all together with a, with a silicone uh, glue. And um, you've, you've got this great uh, shelter. And what you see here is kind of taking it up a notch where you can see there's a linoleum tile on the floor of the shelter and um, uh, the, the uh, kind of, what do you call that paper that you use, contact paper on the insides. So you don't have to get that fancy, but um, if you want to, it's just a little added feature for the kitties. If you're interested in this design, go to our uh, website, click on this link. We have a feral cat winter shelter page that has the plans uh, for this on there, detailed plans step by step. 
here's another one um, that uh, was put together by a group called the CSM Stray Foundation in Queens, New York. The plans for this, as well as other ideas, again, are on that same page I just referred to on our website. This is a storage bin that has had a door, you can see a doorway cut in it. And then the inside of, of the storage bin is lined with a, this is a one inch uh, styrofoam sheet. And you can see it doesn't have to be exact. Uh, it doesn't have to fit super tight because you've got that outer shell of the storage bin. But you're lining the walls and then there's a piece you put on top before you put the lid on. And um, this will keep the cats uh, nice and warm too. Real simple way to, if you've got one or two cats uh, that you're trying to keep warm, is just to get a styrofoam shipping box. Uh, they're used for meat, fish, vaccines. You can order them in bulk online. And you just, again, you cut a doorway in one of the short sides. Uh, make sure that you leave a few inches up off the ground so that the shelter doesn't flood in the snow or rain. Use the silicone glue to um, attach the top of the shelter. And then uh, use a deck paint to, to paint it and blend it in with the surroundings. And this is this will actually be super warm uh, for the cats. If you get a really nice tight fit when you put the top on, you might choose not to glue it on because when you it'll make it easier to keep the shelter clean if, if you want to clean it periodically, but if you can take the top off. But if, if it's easier, just glue it on or it doesn't fit real tight. Again, for those of, uh, um, who would prefer to um, just take a screwdriver and put the thing together and not have to worry about making your own, you can order a really high quality shelter from Feral Via. Uh, just uh, go to that link. And now also just want to let you know about emergency winter shelter in case you're in a situation where um, you know, maybe you haven't got all the parts you need yet, or you're waiting for an order from Feral Via, um, but hey, there's a snowstorm coming, and you need to get something out there quickly. And that's where you would uh, use this method. And this is basically using cardboard box, which is uh, people are sometimes surprised, but cardboard is really a very good insulation. And if you if you do this uh, method, you, you can actually keep the cats quite warm you put a, a a smaller cardboard box inside of a larger cardboard box, so you're getting two layers of cardboard insulation. And then in any space between the two boxes, you stuff newspaper, which is also good insulation. Wrap the whole thing in plastic, like a plastic painter's drop cloth, and duct tape that plastic on. You know, make sure you've you've cut a, a an opening. Make sure it's raised off the ground so it doesn't get um, real wet. And uh, you've got uh, you know something that will um, last you at least several days and keep the cats quite warm. One question that often comes up when we're talking about winter shelters is, uh, should you have two doors? Now we, you know, because the idea is that you don't want a cat trapped in there if they're being, you know, harassed by a raccoon or chased by a dog or something like that. The idea is to give them a way to escape. In our, in our experience, that situation is pretty rare that other animals are um, harassing the cats in their shelters. And so the, the advantage of having that extra door is not so great because they basically never need it. But the downside is pretty high because you're creating drafts um, especially if you don't have flaps on the doors and you're going to be having a breeze and a draft go through from one door to the other. And that, I think, is in usually more dangerous to the cats than the threat of a, any predators. Now, on the other hand, if you're in an area and there are coyotes or there really is a substantial threat of predators that might go after the cats who, when they're in the shelter, then yeah, then you want to have two doors. But as a general rule, if you're not dealing with that kind of situation, you don't. Now, you can um, 
you can put flaps on the doors of these shelters to also help with insulation and you would definitely want to do that if you have more than one door uh, and what you can do if you're using styrofoam you can um, uh, to attach a flap you could get uh, the the plastic nuts and bolts that are used to attach uh, toilet seats onto the toilet and you can just poke those right through the styrofoam or drill a little hole or whatever you need to do and through the flap. Now the flap needs to be something that's not too thick so that the cats aren't um, don't have a lot of trouble you know just taking it and pushing it back. It's a good idea to get the cats used to using the shelter before you add a flap to it so that they're, they, they know they want to get in there. Um, if they're used to being in there, they're going to figure out how to open the flap pretty, pretty quickly. If they've never been in there, they might just kind of walk away. Another question that comes up is, well, how do you get them to start using it? Uh, if they don't just naturally do it right away, sprinkle some catnip inside, you know, put something really attractive in there. Um, some some treats, something like not a lot. You don't want to attract insects, but just enough to get them curious and and wanting to go inside and check it out. Placement of these shelters is real important too. Um, so what what you don't want to do is what you see here in this shelter, which is having these. So this is um, these are the neighborhood cats winter shelters, but obviously they were never never painted. So, you know, they kind of stick out like a sore thumb, right? You know, the bright pink. Whereas if you just put a coat of gray deck paint or brown or something like that, they'll blend right into the scenery. And and that's that's better. It's it's safer for the cats. So um, try to be discreet and place them, especially, you know, because it's winter time. If you can keep the shelters close to the feeding station and the cats don't have to travel very far from one to the other, that's going to be uh, better for them, especially if there's a lot of snow on the ground or things like that. Another trick you can do, which you can see in this photo, is do you see how um, there's, looks like two winter shelters on um, side to side, and then there's two more right across from them and there's that opening in the middle and there's a piece of wood spanning that opening so you can see how the snow is stacked up on top of that piece of wood and the ground um, in front of the shelters is dry so using that piece of wood kind of creates a, a, a porch area and in, in really bad weather you can put food and water in that opening and the cats don't have to travel anywhere and they don't have to go through the snow or um, any elements in order to get to their food. So if you've got more than one shelter, having them face each other and putting a big piece of wood like plywood to cover the roofs, it's gonna weigh the shelter down, it's gonna create um, this kind of uh, space that the cats can be fed in if you need to. What do you put inside the shelters? So if you if you can, you know, putting, adding, insulating, insulating materials is, is great because it just makes everything warmer. If you can't check the shelters, if you put the shelter, and, and this, look, this happens, right? You, you are able to set the winter shelters up, you, you get them in a great place, but you're not gonna be able to regularly access that spot um, and check to make sure that everything inside the shelter is staying dry. If that's your situation, then don't use insulating materials because you need to be able to check that everything, nothing got wet. Uh, because if, if they get wet, then it then it can just make the cats uh, sick. So if you can't check regularly um, every couple of days or a few days, something like that, then then just don't don't use this stuff. But if you can, the best is straw. Um, and people get confused between straw and hay. They think they're the same thing, but they're not. They're, they're two completely different things. Straw is dry, um, hay is moist, hay is a feed for animals, straw is not. Um, and the problem with hay is because it's moist, it can get moldy. And if the cats are in there among moldy hay, they can get um, infections in their 
uh, nasal passages and um, all sorts of bad stuff. So make sure you're using straw. And the thing that's great about straw is it lets the cats burrow into it. And that's the big principle when you're talking about putting things inside the winter shelters. That needs to be something the cats can get or have around them that they can burrow into. You don't want things that they that are flat and they lie on top of because those don't add warmth. They actually take it out of the cat. So um, if you can't use straw, then the thing we recommend next is shredded newspaper because again, they can burrow into that. If you're um, an exception to that rule, which is don't use flat newspaper, don't use blankets or towels that are lying flat, is something called a purr pad. And that, um, it will, uh, it, it uh, retains the cat's body heat. So it becomes like a warm pad that they're lying on. Uh, so if you get uh, that product, that's fine. You can put that in there and, and, and they will stay warm just by lying on top of it. For climates that are extra cold, you can line the walls and the ceiling of the, the interior walls and ceiling of the shelter with what's called a mylar blanket. And they cost like a dollar, two dollars each. And they, um, they reflect body heat back. So if they're on the wall, um, the cat's body heat is not only gonna be trapped by the insulation, it's the mylar is gonna shoot it back at the cat and kind of keep them extra warm. And you would use, you know, a good glue to to attach them. They're very they're very lightweight and and easy to cut up. By the way, if you live in a cold climate, it's a really good idea to have one of these mylar blankets in your car at all times, because if you ever get stuck and it's below freezing, you can take one of those mylar blankets and wrap it around yourself, and it will keep you warm uh, until you know help. Uh, arrives. And that's what they're designed for. Okay, moving on from winter shelters, let's talk about uh, neighbor relations and trying to, um, you know, solve common complaints, even though your cats are fixed and they're well behaved and they're well fed. Um, I'm sure many of you have experienced um, people have issues with them anyway. So let's talk about some of the ways that um, we can deal with that. One of the most common complaints is people don't want the cats in their yards. And they may have any number of reasons. They may be allergic or they may uh, be concerned about their children playing in an area that might have cat feces. They just may, might not like cats. And the cats may be digging up their flower garden or their vegetable garden. Um, so the point is that People can have legitimate reasons for, um, I mean, I'd rather have a cat in my yard than, a, than vegetables, but that's me. Somebody else, you know, can, can justifiably have the opposite opinion. So rather than arguing with people about cats' rights, um, it's better to work with them to keep the cat out of their area. And if you're talking about your typical backyard, it's not that hard to do. You know, if you're talking about an acre, that's harder. But if you're talking about your average suburban um, or urban backyard, you can use what's called deterrence. And there's two main types, that, and you see both of them here. One is um, hooked up to a sprinkler, and it uses water to deter the cats. And the other is an ultrasonic device that uses a, a very high-pitched sound that we can't hear as humans but the cat's here and it's very irritating to them. And the way both of these devices work is you, you place them um, on the ground and then they send out an infrared field that covers a certain amount of territory. You should you know, make sure you have enough that the size of the yard matches the capacity of the device. And then when a cat steps into the infrared field, it sets the device off. So in the case of the sprinkler, it um, the, the sprinkler will shoot out a burst, like a violent burst of water. And it doesn't get the cats wet, but it's, it scares them. And the ultrasonic device starts giving off that really irritating sound. And what happens is 
the cats become trained not to step into the infrared field and they stay out of the yard. Um, take, sometimes it takes a little longer with the ultrasonic device because most cats will just immediately leave, but occasionally there's, there's one or two who try to tough it out and it takes them several days or even a week before they just are like, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Now, the thing about, we, we like, we prefer when it's possible to use the sprinkler because it's just, you, you can see it working. You know, you can see a cat step in the yard, the thing goes off and the cat runs away. It's very simple. Um, the ultrasonic device, you, you, you can't hear it, you can't see it. So you, it's easier to make mistakes with it. And um, there are a lot of common mistakes, like a lot, a lot of people think like, oh, these devices don't work. But that's because they put them up too high off the ground or they weren't pointed in the right direction or they got a device that was too small. So we put together a, like a real short brochure with a lot of diagrams on how to use an ultrasonic cat deterrent. And that's one of the handouts that you have today. So if you're thinking about using one, I would encourage you, make sure you download that handout. Um, and let me mention while I'm at it, um, go ahead and, and download the Neighborhood Cats TNR Handbook as well. That's kind of a good reference material where we go into um, a lot of the things we're talking about today into, into quite a bit more depth, with just the caveat that it was written in 2014. So some of the product information is gonna probably be stale. But there's a lot of good information in there about the stuff we're talking about today. So um, really good devices. Um, uh, after a while, you, you know, what we found with the sprinkler is uh, you can take it apart after a while um, once the cats have been trained not to go in the yard. Oh, here's, here's a diagram of um, the ultrasonic and some of the things that can go wrong with it. So you need to have the correct range. So this device has a 25 foot range, it goes up to the edge of the fence. If the fence was 50 feet away, it's not gonna do you much good. You need a bigger device. Uh, another thing that comes up with these ultrasonic devices are people are, are, are afraid it's gonna disturb their cats inside or their neighbor's cats or things like that. The, the radio waves that um, are given off by this device, the sound waves I should say, do not penetrate solid objects. So if you have a fence, the sound waves are going to stop at the fence. They're, if you, if the cat, your pet cat's indoors, they're not going to hear this. You can also get devices that are not irritating to birds. So there's a whole variety on the market that you can you can look at. So they need to be set up um, not too high off the ground, only about I think maybe six inches at the most. They need to be pointed in the right place. You need to make sure the batteries are functioning, and like I say they can take a little more time than the sprinkler before the cats um, decide out they, they don't want to hang around. Another way to help with, with common, you know, I don't want cats around here problems is, uh, especially with gardens, are, are what we call physical barriers. So um, car covers, if, if people are complaining about paw prints or even scratches or something like that, then just get a a cover that's easy to take on and off. There's an example of one uh, there, but there's you know hundreds of them on the market. You can use cat-proof fencing. I know somebody wrote with a question about they don't want they 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 would like their cats not to roam as much. Well, you can um, probably the only way to keep them from going off your property is to fence them in, and you can do that with the cat-proof fencing. And perfect fence is one example. If you have an already existing like wooden fence, you can get kind of perfect fence attachments for the top of the fence. And the cats can climb uh, these uh, fences, but they can't climb over them. So they, they remain restricted in that, uh, in that area. You can also take these fencing and turn the tops of them to face the other direction and somebody can use them to keep cats out instead of keeping cats in. Now they do tend, you know, tends to be your more expensive um, solution, but you know, it's the, it's there if you, if you really need it. Uh, cat scat mats are that kind of spiky looking plastic thing you see. Um, you can get 
I think it's 11, 12 foot rolls of them at a pretty good price. And what you do is you put that in the ground in the garden area and it, it doesn't hurt the cats, but obviously it makes digging um, something that's unpleasant um, since it pokes their paws and uh, they'll, they'll stop uh, using that garden as their litter box. Same idea is if you put lattice down um, on the ground in your where you where somebody's going to be planting and you put the seeds in between the openings of the lattice again you're preventing the cats from digging and discouraging them from um, eliminating there and then finally river rocks same thing they can be um, scattered throughout a, a garden area and the cats will not go there because they can't dig the, through the rocks Here's an example of somebody who didn't want the cats on their car cover. So what we did is we got a couple of those long rolls of the cat scat mats, and we just um, used bungee cords to attach them to the top of the car. And this uh, prevented the cats from hanging out and ripping up the car cover and um, you know, generally um, hanging out there. So again, it doesn't hurt them, uh, but you know, if they, jump up once, they're not going to jump up on that again. So that's that's obviously if the car is being stored for a long time, you probably wouldn't want to go out every morning and be rolling up your cat scat mats and then rolling them back. But if a car is being stored somewhere for any length of time, then this, this might be a good way to keep the cats off. Another alternative is to um, give the cats a place to go that they'll find more attractive than the garden or wherever it is uh, that they're going. And you can do something like you see here, like a, a, a plastic um, kitty sandbox. Cats are gonna love this. Um, again, you just, you know, you just need to keep an eye on it and, and replace the sand every now and then. The kitty box sand is usually pretty inexpensive. And you could, you could just every, you know, gauge how long it takes before it starts to, you know, kind of get too full and smelly and then just dump it and replace it with new sand. Another alternative is to get a big bag of peat moss and stick that in a corner of the yard or nearby. The cats like to eliminate in peat moss too. It's, it's a soft, um, easily uh, material that's very easy to dig. And then again, once in a while, just throw away all the peat moss and, and replenish it with a fresh batch. You can also use a storage bin like we showed with the feeding stations and the winter shelters and cut a hole in it and put a litter box inside, um, which would be pretty easy to clean. So again, the idea is you're, you're creating an alternative, more attractive place uh, for the cats to go so that they stay away from the problem area. Okay, so let's get into our last um, topic for today before we um, finish up and take questions. And that's uh, what we call health hacks. And that's, um, you know, obviously if we're talking about severe injury or serious illness, you're going to um, need to get the cats to a veterinarian. But for just kind of general ma maintaining of the cats and the colony's health, uh, you can do that in a way that's not too costly and, and not too difficult by using some of the tips that we're going to go over now. So vitamin C is um, a great immune booster that um, we can take advantage of. It is particularly, now, now cats will naturally generate a certain amount of vitamin C themselves, but that, that source, that, that supply of vitamin C gets used up very quickly during times of stress. So when during the trapping or if they have to go to the vet or if they're, you're dealing with severe weather, they can start to use up their own internal vitamin C pretty quickly. So if you supplement it, you can help them get through those stressful periods without getting sick. You can use a powdered supplement. Um, you can um, also use organic tomato sauce that does not have onion as an ingredient, because the onion can be dangerous. And uh, a lot of people don't know, but the tomato sauce has 
is, is a very rich source of vitamin C and the cats uh, really um, tend to like it. You can give up to uh, 250 milligrams, um, about a teaspoonful per cat with um, each meal. Uh, they will excrete whatever excess vitamin C they take in. They, they, they don't over, they can't overdose on vitamin C unless, you know, you, you really go over the top. And um, so really just something as simple as putting a little tomato sauce on top of their food, uh, especially for the cats that like it, is going to get them some of that extra vitamin C. So good idea, like winter wintertime, uh, before you're about to trap, things like that. This is another um, supplement that can be really helpful, especially for male cats. It's called D-Monos, again, over the counter. And um, it's a cranberry, it's a powdered cranberry extract. And it, um, it helps get rid of harmful bacteria in the urinary tract and prevent uh, urinary tract infections, which can be, as I say, since male cats have very um, narrow urinary tracts, you really don't want crystals forming and blocks happening because that can become very serious. So if you want to just, again, during a period of stress or um, if a cat you think is showing signs of a, of a, you know, a urinary UTI, um, give them this dosage, about an eighth of a teaspoon twice a day per cat. And you can just give it to the colony in general anyway now. Um, in order to maintain uh, maintain their health, but especially during times that might be stressful. Uh, if you have cats who you, you know are prone to any kind of lower lower urinary tract disease, really good idea to, to keep them on this. It's like, um, you know, how people, um, if they get a urinary tract infection, you know, drink a lot of cranberry juice. It's exactly the same, same ingredient. Probiotics are another great way to maintain health um, and keep their intestines and, and the bacteria that's in their gut uh, healthy and, and um, lots of it there. Uh, there's, there's plenty of products out there. Uh, they're also really good if a cat is on antibiotics because the antibiotics will kill a lot of the good bacteria in the intestines and then the probiotics will replenish it. You can add it to the food or water and again it's about quarter teaspoon per cat uh, daily. And Jackson Galaxy makes, uh, he makes a cat probiotics and there are a number of other brands that are out there. Um, you know, he, he make his are, I think are one you can, you can trust. He makes good stuff. Okay, fleas becomes, it's a big issue often for colony caretakers. And we're back to our, our uh, product diet, Tamisha's Earth. Again, emphasizing that you're talking about food grade, not pool grade. So as I explained before, diet Tamisha's Earth isn't actually Earth. It's these miniature fossilized marine creatures. And um, you're basically, it's their shells and they're very sharp on a microscopic level. So they will kill fleas on contact and you can sprinkle it into um, any cracks or crevices, places where fleas are prone to hang out. Um, again, make sure you're wearing a dust mask. You don't want to be inhaling this stuff. Um, you're perfectly safe if you just have an ordinary dust mask on. But uh, some people uh, use it to, you know, carefully to, to uh, wipe a cat with it. It's kind of a you know, poor man's version of flea medicine because it kills on contact. And if the cat licks it off their fur, it's fine. If, if it's food grade, it's not going to hurt them at all. Um, we've used them, seen or seen them used in like mobile home parks, things like that, like underneath the mobile home and um, inside again, along where the floor meets the wall, things like that. Or if you're outdoors and there's, you know, some type of opening in a brick wall, anywhere the fleas may maybe hanging out, you, you sprinkle, sprinkle this over it and that'll, that'll take care of it. Another product is what's called beneficial nematodes. These are like tiny little worms that um, you spread on uh, the lawn in warmer weather and make sure you don't spray them onto the lawn in the sun. You wanna do it in the shade or the sun will kill them right away. 
So you you have an attachment to your hose, you put the beneficial nematodes in, and then you literally spray them onto the lawn in the shade. As they grow and spread throughout the lawn, they eat all the flea larvae in the area. They just devour the fleas, uh, flea larvae. And um, so if, if that's your situation, you're talking about a grassy area where you have a little bit of shade where you can start them off, um, it's a great natural way to control fleas. Now, if you're talking about um, over-the-counter um, products, ones that uh, are in, in, ingestible, because you know if you're dealing with a lot of community cats, a lot of them you're not going to be able to put like Advantage or Frontline or something and squeeze that in between their shoulder blades because you can't get close enough to them. So this this medicine will kill fleas with all the fleas um, on the cat within 30 minutes. And you can get it over the counter with no prescription. It doesn't kill larva. It doesn't provide long-term uh, protection. It just kills all the adult fleas that are on the cat at that time. So it's a good kind of maintenance medication if you give it to them once in a while. And you can put it in their food. You just have to be careful that you know each cat gets the right dosage. It's, it's safe for kittens over two pounds. And its active ingredient, as you can see written there, is not, called night and pyrum. This Capstar is kind of the original. Um, brand in this in this space but you can find uh, generic versions with the exact same ingredient the exact same amount that are usually quite a bit cheaper they tend to have you know kind of rip off names like cap action and stuff like that but it, that's fine if, if they have if they're made of night and pyrum and there's 11.4 milligrams per pill it's the exact same thing as a capstar Uh, worms are another, um, you know, common issue with with colony cats. Now, understand with fleas and worms that community cats are a healthy community cat is going to have a certain level of fleas. It's going to have a certain number of worms in their system, and that's fine. That's true for any animal that's living outdoors. They're going to have a kind of um, certain parasite load. And that itself is not a problem that becomes a problem if it becomes too much and there's too many worms and there's too many fleas. That can be indicative, indicative of some underlying health issue. So if you've got a community cat, uh, you know, who, who's excreting large amounts of worms, but the other colony cats are looking fine, it's probably something you, you need to go to a vet, have the bring the cat to a vet and, and find out why does this cat have um, some type of immune problem and is not does not have a healthy balance of worms, or why is this cat infested with fleas and the others are not, or um, things like that. It's usually a sign of some underlying health issue. But nonetheless, you may want to get rid of the worms every now and then, just kind of clean out their system. So you can get these medications over the counter. A drontal, um, you can get at petmeds.com and it's expensive. It's like $6 a pill, but it's, it's a broad spectrum. It kills like all different kinds of worms. So if you think it's an issue, it's worth administering every now and then. Um, this other tape, tapeworm dewormer is exactly that. It's for tapeworms. And then if you want to go the more holistic route, you can, um, I haven't tried this, but it looks like an interesting product that is a broad spectrum impacts a lot of different kinds of worms and it's uh, homeopathic in uh, in its uh, nature. So you can get that at Chewy.com. All right, two questions that are sort of on the same theme, I think. First question is, um, what are your thoughts about trapping cats that need to be revaccinated and how do you do that and also, how do you trap a sick cat? Okay, well, you know, revaccination is really a matter of, um, you know, realistically, not very many people do it because it's it's pretty difficult. And I think a lot of it has to do with, um, well, well, let me say, it, 
for the rabies vaccine, which is the one most people are concerned about, um, we know they're good for three years, but we don't know how long they're good for because they stop the trials after three years. So there's that, you know, you may be, re so really the main motivation for retrapping them is going to be a legal uh, one that, that you had, there's an ordinance that requires it that you have public health people or animal control people who are insisting upon it. So that's most likely realistically when you're gonna um, make that effort to revaccinate them, or you may very strongly believe yourself that they should be revaccinated, which is perfectly fine. The key to retrapping cats who are already fixed is um, number one, that they're on a feeding pattern. So it's predictable where they're gonna be and when they're gonna be there. And then the number one thing you're gonna try is to use a way to capture them that you, you didn't use the first time. So if you caught them with an ordinary box trap, you know, the long narrow traps, uh, then the next time you trap, you're gonna use a drop trap, right? And vice versa. And uh, we go over that in the TNR certification workshop. There's a free webinar that's been recorded on the Community Cats podcast page on drop traps. So there's information, plenty of information out there about how to do these, use these things. Um, also, it depends how much time has passed. Uh, a lot of cats do forget if it's years later that, that they were trapped. So it takes a little more effort, but if you do those two things, have them on a feeding pattern, use a way of trapping them that you didn't use the first time, then you should be you should be okay. And there was a second part to that question, but I don't remember what it was. Yeah, uh, trapping a sick cat. Tricky because it depends what they're sick with. So if they're injured, like they have a gash on their leg, um, if it's more of an injury type of situation, or they or are you noticing a growth? on, on the, the back of their neck or something like that, you wanna have it checked out. Hunger, hunger is gonna be the same thing. You're gonna deprive them of food, you're gonna get them hungry, and you should be able to trap them in that manner. If, you have a, if you're trying to just pick one out f from a, the rest of the colony, then you wanna learn how to use a drop trap because you decide when to pull the string and which cat to catch. Now, the tricky part is when they have severe upper respiratory infections and they can't smell, right? And then they, you know, cats that can't smell won't eat. But they, have you ever seen sick cats where they come over to the food and then they just kind of look at it and they don't, they, they don't eat it because they don't quite recognize it, but they can still, if you get something that's super, super smelly, like, um, you know, mackerel or some type of a human grade tuna. And, and what you're trying to do is get that scent through to them. Um, also at some point, even though they can't smell, they may become hungry enough, um, may take a two or three days to, to go in, but you, you need to try to get the scent through their, their stuffness. Um, you might, um, you know, it, it's tough. It's tough with the with the cats that that have um, are severely congested. But keep trying. Um, you can try with toys. You can try with laser pointers. Try to ch chase the cat under a drop trap. Um, things like that. Study where they hang out. Put a drop trap there, and maybe they'll hang out under it, and you'll be able to trap them that way. With the congested cats, it do, it does take quite a bit of, of more more effort to get them. There's a comment in here with uh, sort of the telemedicine theme. When we cannot trap a sick cat, we take a video for our vets, and that seems to appease the new laws that they have actually seen the cat in person. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. If you, if you have a veterinarian willing to work with you that way and you can show them the congestion, they may be able to prescribe something. Of course, then you got to get the medicine into the cat. <laughs> right. Which so is, that's going on to the yeah. next the next theme, which was another person said, you know, how do you ensure you're getting meds in the food evenly um, for the cats? And then another person just suggested using some L lysine for preventing URIs. Yeah, lysine lysine is um, an amino acid that has um, some antiviral properties. 
it's 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 not a strong antiviral but it will help you know it's it's a marginal marginal help so it is best used as a preventative i i agree as as opposed to a, a cure um how do you ensure each the cats are getting well you you have to um work at it you know you have to dole up the food into portions and then um do the best you can to make sure each cat's getting the right amount. Most of these medications have fairly high toxicity levels, meaning that it would take a lot to overdose on them. So you don't have to get it, you don't have to worry too much about overdosing, although you wanna make sure that's true about what the toxicity level is. You know, for cats who aren't getting enough of the medication, that that's tougher. And yeah, there's no, there's no magic uh, formula. One, you know, if it's really super important, you could try trapping the cats and then um, isolating them so that they only get their share of food. But, but of course, that's that's a huge effort too. So, no, no easy way to do that, I'm afraid. Um, so, we have a couple questions on the spay neuter theme of things um, here. So, you know, how does one find a veterinarian that will spay neuter feral cats at no or low cost? And if such a vet doesn't exist in your area, how do you introduce yourself to a vet and try and get connected with one? So the first place, I think the best resource these days is the United Spay Alliance's website, right, Stacey? They, with the, they have a very extensive database they spent a lot of time building on um, low cost spay neuter. Uh, so wherever you are in the in the country, in the United States, go to United Spay Alliance's website and check out their database. Um, you can also go to, I believe, uh, Spay USA has a voucher system with um, low cost spay neuter and also Friends of Animals is another national spay neuter, uh, low cost spay neuter network. So those are the, be the first places to go. If, you, if there's nothing in your area, I would, um, first thing I would do is uh, find a rescue group in your area, call them up, ask them who they're using. If you might be able to uh, work with that veterinarian or call your local shelter, ask them if they have a list of, of veterinarians who provide low cost services. And then if worse comes to worse, um, if you have animals of your own, talk to your veterinarian and, and see if they will give you a discount. Um, often veterinarians will treat their own clients more, more um, preferentially. When it comes to um, kind of cold calling a veterinarian that you don't have any relationship with, uh, that's just a lot of knocking at do on doors and, and talking. A lot of them will say no, but you just need one um, who will say yes. When I started out with neighborhood cats, we used to approach veterinarians who had just opened their um, clinics because they wanted any business they could get. <laughs> and then there are also veterinarians who who want um, the experience, who want to gain experience with spay neuter, who will be open to it. So, you know, try all those different routes. Excellent. Excellent. Um, okay. Um, at what what age do you recommend that um, kittens get spayed or neutered? Well, if they're if they're um, uh, feral, or if they're going to be going back outside, then you want to fix them when you catch them, <laughs> right? You don't want to catch a feral kitten and then say, "Oh, you're, you're you're too young. I'll be back in a month or two because you may not get that opportunity again. And if you're dealing with um, experienced high volume spay neuter specialist surgeons, they, they, their cutoff is usually two months, two pounds. I've seen them do as young as six weeks, but those are the surgeons who are very experienced. Now, what these surgeons will tell you is if you can wait until they're three months old and three pounds, uh, they're usually a little more comfortable doing the surgeries. So if you can wait, then give it till th three months. Um, but if, you've, if you're doing a big trapping and kittens are among the cats that you've caught, uh, just, just uh, get them fixed as long as the veterinarian is comfortable doing it. 
just want to let you know, folks, there are, you know, there are some other sort of detailed questions in here um, that we're not going to have time to answer today, but um, Su it gives Susie two or three, four weeks, you know, she will get to the questions eventually. She's actually been doing a great job out there keeping up on most of the questions, but um, we'll scan through them again afterwards and make sure. But if you feel like your question hasn't been answered, you can always email me at stacy at communitycatspodcast.com and I will I will get that um, information, you know, for you. Here's a, a tip from Dana. Uh, in a pinch, you can use Chewy's uh, chat with a vet option. They won't prescribe, but they can look up vet options for you and give you some research and info on the medical condition. And then there is someone else who had a, a good suggestion about using churro, trying to use that as part of the, the bait and getting, getting the cats in on that. Um, I've, my cat, oh, I've mixed meds into churro, uh, only putting the churro mix into the bowl. The cat eats that first before any of the food. And I ensure that the cat has taken the meds. So Dana's full of great suggestions here. Yeah, I like that suggestion a lot, which is don't put the medicine in their full meal. You know, put it in like gravy or churro. I'm not sure what that is, but it sounds tasty. And, um, you know, some little bit of tuna juice or a piece of tuna or whatever, and let them eat that before you give them the full meal. That That's a great idea for making sure they get they get the dosage. Everybody's in shock. You don't know what churro is. Even I don't I know do. what churro is. What is churro? <laughs> Enlighten me. <laughs> it's um, like it's like uh, this gooey stuff in a tube um, that cats like they use. The fear-free people use it all the time. They have the cats licking it while they're like giving them a vaccine in the back. So the cat like is totally obsessed with the with the treat food, and it's in this tube. It's like pasty stuff. Um, and go, oh, there you go, Monica. Thank you. I, I knew I needed some help here. It's like gogurt for cats. She's calling it. <laughs> okay. And, um, and yeah. And it, okay. So Dana's going, okay. Churro is going to change your life. You can slip <laughs> meds in it and the cats won't know. It comes in various flav flavors. And she says it's like, um, gogurt for cats. I personally, when I had my cat, I tried some churro, um, when he was near the end of his time. And I think I just, it was just too late for him. He was not interested in anything. So I had a lot of churro at my house at the end there. It's wonderful for hydration support when cats are sick too. So, okay, great. Um, well, hey, it's a two-way street learning here. So exactly. Yeah. This is great. Yeah. It's fantastic. So, um, all right, excellent. Well, we are at the um, four o'clock hour here. Um, reminder to everybody: there will be um, there will be the recording will be coming out. You should get a link from GoToWebinar, but then we'll also post it on the website. We'll post it on our YouTube page, and so I'll send out. I'll try and remember send an email out to the group to make sure that everybody knows the recording's coming out. Email me at Stacy at Community Cats Podcast if you want the handouts. I know a couple of people had some problems downloading the slides, so I'll take a look at that file and make sure it's um, a, a solid. PDF I, and I get it out. I've sent it out to a couple of people and I don't think I've had any problems, but we'll double check on all that. And next, next time we'll see Brian and Susie will be on October 1st at the TNR certification workshop. Huge favor, please share this with others, the certification workshops. We have over 5,000 people, I think now that have attended these TNR certification workshops. So let's just keep it rolling. Let's keep it rolling and get more, more, uh, more folks here. Get more, you know, certificates, certificates, and get more vets hooked in and understanding how to help um, community cats and get them spayed and neutered. Um, I know it's tough out there, but um, really appreciate everybody. Thank you all for joining us today, Brian. Thank you, Susie, Kristen in the background. Thank you. Um, thank you again, everybody. Thanks for turning your passion for cats into action. Check out neighborhoodcats.org, communitycatspodcast.com, and hopefully we'll see you on the 1st of October. Take care. Thanks.